to uh, introduce. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce President Len Jessup, who is our speaker today. Uh, President Jessup has over 30 years of experience in executive education, um, both in the public and private sectors. And he has a lot to share with us today. I, I can't wait, Lend. Thank you. Thanks, Regina. Can you hear me okay? Well, welcome everyone. It's, it's a, a real privilege to be able to kick off the series again this year. It was just about a year ago, almost to the day that we did this. And I started the, the series last year and was talking about kind of the, we were just getting into the, the thick of things with the pandemic and the lockdown. And we were talking about how to deal with change in that initial presentation. And so this year, our title is What's Next? Life After the Pandemic. Uh, now that we're a little more than a year in, uh, and what do we expect is gonna be coming uh, after this is done, if it's ever done. So go ahead and flip to the next slide if you would, and I'll begin. Thanks. So <clears throat> as Regina said, so I'm president here. I've been in just a little more than uh, coming up on the three year mark. And I was president at UNLV for a term before that. And then I was a business school dean a couple times and a professor in technology and entrepreneurship uh, for, for decades. Uh, whoops, sorry, let me turn that off. Uh, for, okay, I'm gonna turn this off just one moment. And not, none of that uh, prepared me for what we're going through now, having to lead in these tur turbulent times. Think about what we've all been through this past 13 months. I think I've heard the word unprecedented more in the last 13 months than I have, I think, over the course of my entire life before that. But it really is unprecedented. Uh, one of my board members said to me just recently, think about, think about this. Take the, the flu of 1918, another pandemic that the world lived through, uh, that was really horrific. And he said, put on top of that simultaneously the crash, economically, the crash of 1929, and then put on that, top of that, simultaneously, the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and then put on top of that, the contentious presidential election that we went through in the fall, and that we experienced those all at once, uh, or at least within a, a very short amount of time. And so when you think of it that way, it really has been unprecedented. Uh, you know, the, at least the, the, the world, the modern world recorded history, we've never really been through something like that all at one time. And go ahead and flip to that next slide. You gave a sneak preview of it. And that kind of, that road going off into the forest. Many have said to me that they wish that they could have seen this coming. Could they have seen the pandemic coming or COVID? It's COVID-19, there, there were COVID viruses before. So couldn't we have all seen this coming? And that's a tough thing to do, seeing around corners. There's actually a book titled by that now and a lot written in the leadership literature about the, the ability of leaders to seemingly be able to see around that proverbial corner. That's tough to do in this instance, unless you're an infectious disease expert and, or you're really reading up on your epidemiology, trying to see around corners, predicting the future in that way for sort of the normal uh, mere mortal leaders leading cities or leading communities like you're doing is a difficult thing to do. We, it's difficult, but we teach that. We, can, you, we can't teach that. that. That is a learned behavior. We often teach that in executive education courses or in MBA, in MBA programs on leadership. It's difficult to do, but it can be done. You have to pick a domain that you're trying to forecast. You have to literally go to school talking to subject matter experts, uh, reading lots of literature and research and development, either out of the university or out of the corporate environment or tracking the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health, like literally tracking what calls for proposals they're putting, at, putting out to try to, as best you can, find the leading indicators within a specific domain. But pick your domain. You, you're gonna do that all through the life sciences and the rest of the hard sciences and through electrical engineering, you just can't do it uh, as an individual. Similarly, you know, organizations can build that muscle, they can develop that muscle to try to see around corners but you've got to have teams of people forecasting in each of those domains that you think are the important domains. So it can be done, but it's difficult. 
Some people believe that it may be easier, flip to the next slide, to do <clears throat> what our little friend does here, the chameleon and just be adaptive. So if I can't, I really don't have the time, resources, effort, or the will to try to be doing the work to see around corners, then as a leader and as an organization, I'm gonna to try to develop the muscle personally or build the muscle, bake it into the organization to try to be more open and adaptable to the environment around me, both as a leader and as an organization. And we teach that, that that's a learned behavior. It can be taught as a leader and it can be, and it can be built in to the muscles within the organization. There's a lot written about this at the organization level. Biological terms like absorptive capacity or requisite variety are being sort of taken from biological sciences and applied to organizations. You can build these muscles to adapt. A lot of the research on design thinking right now, a very collaborative brainstorming approach are used to try to build in open, openness and adaptiveness and collaboration into how organizations function. So one way or the other, I mean, there are things you can do to try to prep for this, but boy, is it tough to do. I think we're all, we're all experiencing that. We have experienced it for a better than a year. So let's flip now to so CGU. I'll give some updates to what we talked about a year ago. The, so first, what I wanna say is there were some preparations at Claremont Graduate University that we took before the pandemic that and then we were starting to flex muscles that really paid off as then co the COVID-19 virus hit, flexing muscles before we needed them. We took and still take emergency prepar preparation and disaster management planning and preparation very seriously. We do mock events, or at least we did before the, the downturn. So we take it very seriously. That helped when we had to mobilize quickly to make changes to go online and to take everybody to remote work literally overnight. We, another example, we had developed two online master's degrees completely online before the pandemic. And thank goodness we did because then over a year ago, we had spring break, that was it. We had a week to get everything over to online learning. Fortunately, we had already done two full master's deg degrees online. There were other universities locally and around the region that hadn't done any online yet. So imagine having to go online literally in a matter of days if you've never done it before. Um, we also happened to, we used an outside provider to build those online programs. And then we had weaned ourselves away from the outside provider and then taken that all in-house. We had instructional designers uh, and instructional technologists and we were able, so that made it easier then to do it on our own quickly. Uh, we had built a classroom of the future with the help of ViewSonic and Acer. And that's a room that helps us do remote learning. Thank goodness, that helped. Um, we were treating information technology as a strategic asset already, not as a commodity. That helped us. So we were already flexing some muscles to be an open and adaptive and collaborative organization. And man, did that help us out when we had to make the shift quickly. Then we, yeah, just go ahead and leave it there. We responded to the pandemic then we took advantage of the wolf at the door, the crisis, and we responded to the pandemic in ways that helped us set up for success post pandemic. So we weren't looking at decisions over the last year as how do I solve this decision now? We were looking at them as decisions where how can I now set our, you know, how we set the organization up for success post pandemic? And I'll give you some examples. So now sort of starting to think this is the 10,000 foot view above Claremont on a beautiful winter day. And we just, we had some days just like this uh, over the past several months, but we took the long view as we made decisions during the pandemic. So for example, we continue to develop and build out our, those emergency response muscles. We've, we've built in a, a many new processes that are sort of COVID task forces that, that will endure post pandemic. We probably won't, some of them meet, one, one particular COVID task force meets three times a week still. We probably won't meet three times a week through the summer and into the fall as things let up, but that, I guarantee that task force will continue to meet at least in some form or fashion. We developed, as we went to online learning, another example, think about this in terms of your online services that you're providing to your communities. We didn't take that as just a short-term solution. 
So, you know, in, initially we said to faculty, look, we just need you to get online like quickly in a couple of days. So just take what you're doing. And for that live session you're doing with students, just do that in Zoom and just do that. So we, in the next few days, so we can quickly get everybody off campus. And then we got through the last spring doing that. But then in the, in the summer, we sat down with all the faculty and we took all those classes and redesigned them from the ground up as true online courses built out in a learning management system. In our case, we chose a tool called Canvas. And so all of our courses now are all built out in Canvas, an online learning management system that so that when students now register for courses, maybe they're taking five courses, they're all in Canvas on an online dashboard. All their courses, one-stop shopping, everything is online. It's really easy to use, really slick. It was a conscious decision we made so that now Post pandemic, it'll all stay that way. Everything will be out offered to students in Canvas, really convenient for students and for faculty. Another example, long-term thinking, we made huge investments in campus safety. So now almost all of our main buildings are card swiped. So that enables us to do contact tracing now and into the future. And, and it's just a safe way to be managing uh, campus and it's more um, sort of less contact physically when you're going into building. You just swipe and you're in and a door will open. Uh, huge investments in our infrastructure technologically on campus because we knew we were building for the future. We would need this post pandemic. So for example, our Wi-Fi now or very quickly will be in really good shape both inside buildings and more important outside of buildings because we're expecting that students and faculty are gonna wanna do things on campus in the fall outside. So the Wi-Fi will enable them to do that. And we've got some great spaces that we're converting to do outside classes if faculty and students wanna do that. So big investments for the long term rather than sort of just solving problems uh, today. Like this event, we've converted everything, all our events and programming, programming to digital and digital platforms. And we expect that that will continue. And then I think more to the point, the, you know, the way that we're now tracking health information from LA County Department of Health from the CDC nationally, those are things that are baked in and we will continue to do that because we, we think that this is not going to stop uh, when we're all allowed to go back to our lives and back to campus and back into our community services later in the summer and into the fall. Uh, I'll leave you with one last anecdote on this section. A year ago, I mentioned a faculty member, we'll call Harry, uh, so we, I won't identify who it is. Some of you may know this person. But a year ago, he was telling us, I absolutely have to have access to my, core, my, my office on campus to be able to teach my online course because at home, the, my home is very small. I have a young son. And when I'm trying to do the Zoom sessions with my class, my son's all behind me and crawling all over me. And so I, abs I have to be on campus to be teaching my courses. And we didn't allow that. And we, we come to find out that the son, we all imagine this unruly toddler crawling all over his dad while he's trying to teach his courses online. We come to find out the son is 18 years old. Uh, and so this, our, our Professor Harry really wanted to get out of the house maybe for other reasons. But that was common of the initial reaction among our employees. And now we're polling and talking with our faculty and staff and in our polling, we've easily got half, I would say at least half our faculty that now really like online teaching and like doing things from home. And that's a marked contrast from where we were a year ago. Uh, and as you'll see here now, as we're talking about for the future, we are listening to our faculty and staff. And that's my, those are the watch words going forward. Listen, 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 listen again, listen more and listen to everyone. Uh, we're continuing to take in all the health, health information that we can get. Like I said, we've baked in processes to assimilate that information quickly into our decision making, and we'll continue doing that going forward. We are talking with all of our stakeholders, whether it's faculty or staff or students or community members around us. And sometimes it's just informal and it's listening. Sometimes it's formal through a survey or polling or little quick spot polling that we're doing online but we're listening to all of our stakeholders and, and really taking in what they're telling us and making changes accordingly uh, as we go forward. What we're hearing, and I, I bet you're hearing the same thing, is that people in our environment are wanting flexibility, 
and convenience. Those are the watchwords for us as we move into the fall. And that's when we expect to go fully uh, back on campus. Many of our classes will actually stay online in the fall, a good portion of them. And whatever's left that will be on campus is still gonna be in a hybrid or blended format because that's what our faculty and staff are telling us that they want to do uh, to feel safe and to feel comfortable and for it to be flexible and convenient. Our, our worst case, think about this in, in your terms of their community. And I think this translates, here's our worst case scenario for the fall. And it's that a student is here uh, in Claremont on campus on a Tuesday night for a class. And after class in the evening, they're driving back home to Pasadena. That would be very typical for one of our students. And on the way home, they're calling, um, not like I'm lifting a phone, but they're Bluetooth, you know, safely in the car. They're, they're, they're calling home to a, a spouse or a partner or whomever's waiting for them at home. And on that drive home after a class on a Tuesday night, the worst case scenario for us is that student is saying to the partner at home, man, that was a waste of time. I really didn't need to drive in for that. And so we're having conversations with the faculty that it needs to be hybrid, it needs to be blended, it needs to be convenient. We need to be offering flexibility to our constituents and that you need to be thinking hard about it. If you're gonna force somebody back onto campus, the old way of thinking about things, it has got to be meaningful for that student or whoever it is uh, that's coming in. And for our employees, we've done a complete 180 on our approach to telework. It, we, we restricted remote work before pandemic. We've now rewritten our telework policy. It's about to be released a new policy that for the fall and going forward, we will be, we're, we're, we want to be flexible around remote work and around telework. And if, and, and if, it, if it's an appropriate and you can get it done in a job, we want to allow that to happen. And even for some faculty maybe who are in staff who are student facing and need to be here some of the time, we want to encourage them to not be here if they need to be at home or somewhere else uh, for some of the time as well. Uh, Clayton Christensen has passed away, uh, but a Harvard Business School professor who's written a lot about disruptive innovation. And he said that higher ed, this is pre-pandemic, higher ed's about to go through its disruption. And man, did we, all of us, right? During the pandemic, have all been forced through that disruptive innovation practically overnight. Practically overnight. I think in higher ed, it's gonna stick for us. And I imagine some of it's gonna stick for you. We're all gonna to have to be flexible and convenient and digitally enhanced. And the power is clearly shifting out of our hands and into the hands of our students and of your community members. And they're gonna be demanding more flexibility and convenience uh, from us going forward. So flip the slide, we'll wrap up. This, uh, this is a slide I used last year that I love and I wanna use it again, but I want a, a little bit different point this time. This, what now we're a year, 13 months in, this was hard on people. You've got to be aware of that and come to grips with it. This was hard, is hard on people. It may be just as simple as that you're someone who's working at home in Zoom all day long. And somebody told me, it's like I'm on a transatlantic flight every single day. Think about if you're flying to the East Coast and then flying to Europe or down to Australia, and you're on a plane for the better part of a day. And what it's like sitting in that seat, you, wa you watch like six movies and you're doing email and whatever else you're doing on whatever device you've got, you're locked in doing that eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. That's what this is like. If, even if you're just at minimum, you're at home and you're working on Zoom all day long, it's like being on a transatlantic flight. Think about how you feel when you get off that flight. Now you're doing that every single day, that's hard. Now think about, you're the person who's a single parent and you're at home and you're on Zoom all day and your kids are home from school and they're trying to do classes from home and you're at home by yourself trying to manage all that. That's even harder. And now imagine you're the person where COVID-19 has really hit your family hard. And in addition to trying to work that way, You've lost people over the last 13 months because of the virus who you couldn't even go see in the hospital. So needless to say, this has been tough on all of, all of us and all of our stakeholders. And so my, the lesson learned that I take away from that is that unfortunately we've seen a lot of resilience and uh, a lot of patience from our faculty and staff and students. 
but we tried to do everything that we could to enable resilience and patience among our employees and among our stakeholders. So we gave extra vacation days, for example, liberally uh, around holidays throughout the past year, and then tried to do things just to try to brighten people's day and, and happy hours in Zoom. And we did some drive, drive in events safely on campus just to lighten things for people um, and be very tolerant of kids and pets and Zoom and those kinds of things. So my point here is you need to keep your eye on the horizon and that's you know about trying to see around corners and, and develop the learning organization, if you will. But you also have to pay attention to what's going on inside the boat. Be mindful of your team members inside the boat, even after pandemic as you go forward and try to build in uh, capabilities for you as a leader and for the organization around being caring and empathetic and authentic. It's, and so let's flip to the last slide and I'll wrap it up. It's so important for you as a leader to continue to be open-minded, sensing, learning, and adaptive as a leader. And I chose those words very carefully. Think about that. Open-minded, sensing, learning, adaptive as a leader going forward. Open-minded, I'm open, I'm aware. I don't have all the answers. I, I need to be talking to other people to get the answers. So open-minded, sensing. Sensing means I'm actually gonna be sensing, scanning, listening, talking. Uh, so open-minded, sensing, and then learning. Learning, I actually take in the information and I actually learn from it. I'm gonna change what I'm about to do. And then adaptive, I'm gonna adapt. I'm gonna make changes to what I'm doing based on what I'm hearing from people about what they need. And so you can develop those muscles as a leader, open-minded, sensing, learning, adaptive, and those things, you can build those muscles in for your organization as well going forward. And you need to, trust me, you need to build in those natural reflexive capabilities for your team and for your organization so that your, your organization is open-minded, sensing, learning, adaptive going forward. I'm borrowing a lot there from Peter Senge on the learning organization. Some people call, it, call him Peter Senge. Peter Senge, I believe, is the appropriate uh, pronunciation of his name. Great stuff on being a learning organization, building in design thinking and how you do things, a collaborative process for solving problems. You'll hear more about that as we go forward. Let's flip to the last slide. And we've got a great lineup this year. Some people you saw last year for returning participants, and you'll see many new speakers. Michelle, Steven, Cindy, Kwamina, Gloria, Kat, Jason and Jeremy. I think you might have seen Jeremy last year. We've got a great lineup for you. You'll learn about these topics and more. This is the seal of this great university, Multa Lumina Una Lux, which uh, translates to many flames, one light. And I just want to leave you with that again, like last year. We all carry this flame forward together. We're all in this together. And I want to thank you all for what you're doing in your communities and in my community in Claremont. And we're here to help you. Uh, so don't hesitate to ask. Thanks again for being on with us for the kickoff of the series. Uh, thanks for listening. And it's, it's a privilege to be able to be here with everybody to kick it off. Thank you. Regina, back to you. Thank you, Len, for your presentation. I have two questions right now from the audience. And if you have more questions, please submit it now. Uh, the first one is, what would you have done differently? People say hindsight is 2020. So now, you know, just wondering, what would you have done differently knowing about the pandemic and so on, the disruption? That's a good question. I, you know, we had made some good moves, like I talked about. We had already developed online programs. We had already started to make some investments in technology. In hindsight, if I could have sped that up, I think it might have been an even smoother transition, but uh, you know, hindsight is 50-50. Is um, we had developed a, another one. We developed a strategic partnership with Western University of Health Sciences just three miles over that's now starting to bear fruit. And I, if I had known, I, I would have definitely started uh, talking with their epidemiologists sooner. Uh, we started doing that rapidly as we were getting into this because we had local experts three miles away who knew you know, already how a virus behaves. And, and especially as it spreads in a population, and I, man, I would have gone over and talked to them a lot quicker if I didn't know. Thank you, Wen. Yeah. The next question we have um, is that um, the public sector sometimes is not known to be 
you know, doing the things you were talking about, open-minded, yeah. sensing, adaptive. So how can I even share with my boss with what I learned today? You know, I would use us as an example. Universities are those institutions that have been around since the dawn of humankind. I mean, we're a thousand years old plus. And man, if we can do it, you can do it. <laughs> it's kind of my, my inspirational part of my comments. But, and then the other thing is just start simple. You know, so design thinking starts, and you can go read about design thinking if you like, but it just starts with just getting, getting people around the table together when we can do it uh, or do it in Zoom, getting the right people around the table just to talk together. And so you may be dealing with an issue and you're, if you're managing a city uh, that you're, you're grappling with, grab, grab a few people, your employees at all levels, grab a few people from your city, people who live in the city, grab stakeholders, get them around a table, try to break down the barriers, break bread, take out the rank, take out the title, just start talking about the problem that you're dealing with. And I guarantee you, you're gonna to get to a better solution, probably quicker and with some pretty good buy-in. Start simple. Thank you, Len. I can see that, uh, that it has already borne a lot of fruit during your time at CJU just by doing exactly what you described. Uh, the next question I have is, is that in terms of listening, being open-minded and sensing, how do you recommend a leader handle the wide range of individual risk tolerance that the pandemic has revealed? A wide range of risk tolerance. It's funny because in, I'm doing a team teaching a class with a doctoral student, Jen Budalobos, on leading change. And we always begin the class by having all of our, our participants in the class fill out. Uh, there's, a night, there's a bunch of these surveys on, that help you to gauge your own propensity toward change, your risk tolerance. And you can identify pretty quickly what your tolerance for ambiguity is. And as long as you've got a group that's in, you know, in a trusting environment and willing to share with each other, we, when we have that in the class, everybody fills it out. And then we talk about our scores and people differ on the scores. Uh, when I used to be a business school professor back in the day, I would do this with my business school undergraduate students. And I had to fill them, fill them out. And then I'd have all the high tolerance for change sit on one side of the room and the, and the low tolerance for change sit on the other side of the classroom. And then we would reveal what each of the students was majoring in. And I, I swear to you, not exaggerating, the accounting students would be all on one side of the room and the entrepreneurship students and the marketing students would be on the other side of the room <laughs> and finance and ops and other majors would be in the middle of the room. And then we would talk about that and why that is. And why the, that you know the, how you feel your propensity toward change affects how you behave at work, and that these students were going to be asking for money from those students uh, eventually as they got into their careers, and how they could how they can deal with that, knowing about that personality difference. And so you could probably look that up well, and you'll see there are little surveys you can find online to do that. And if not, just email Regina, and, and we can get you a link to one of those surveys. It's a great little tool. Uh, to sort of diagnose your team. Thank you, Len. And the next question is that it sounds like you have experienced a lot of change in your career. So how have you developed your resilience and ad adaptation to change in your personal life? It's, you know, so probably not surprising, I score pretty high on that survey on tolerance for ambiguity. Um, and I tend to be someone who, I, I enjoy being in, in, in an environment of change. I enjoy the stimulation and the challenge that goes with it. So that's made it easier for me. I, I think I have some of that in my DNA. And, but, but it's like anything else, it's a muscle that you can start to develop and flex and you get better at it and you get more comfortable with it as you go along. I, yeah, I've been in some incredible situations, really blessed with opportunities um, in situations that, you know, where we've had to do really difficult and challenging things. As you start, as you start to do it a couple of times, you get you get used to it, and it gets to be fun, and you look forward to the challenge. And in fact, when there's not uh, something interesting going on, that actually drives me crazy, probably just as much as it might drive somebody crazy who has a low tolerance uh, for change and ambiguity. I recommend that diagnostic. That's a good that's a good place to start, and then take baby steps in trying to change things one at a time that you know you know intellectually you need to change about what you're doing pick one at a time and start to develop the muscle and flex it. 
Thank you, Len. And another question we have is that if your environment is not open to change, how do you stay sensing and open uh, to change when you have to deal with the resistance from your environment? You know, if you, what we found is we look at, at great leaders and how they behave and then the, the research on leadership is that people can have an incredible amount of influence because leadership is about influence, right? And we, we normally think of it as that the, the title bestowed on someone gives them by, by authority influence to be able to, 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 you know, to affect how to other people think or behave, to be, tell somebody to do something and they do it because of the authority bestowed in you. But what we find in great leaders is that their influence typically doesn't come from the authority formally given to them, but it, it comes in other ways. And what it tells you is that lead, people who are not necessarily in formal leadership positions in organizations or in cities or in communities can actually be quite influential, uh, right? You can, you can, so you can be a leader without having the leadership authority or title. And it's all about, I get back to design thinking. That's worth reading a bit more about. It's about thinking about the other people around you that are involved in whatever that problem is, whatever that situation is, I might not be the city manager or whatever the formal position of authority is, but I can think about what's in it for them. And I can go talk to them and find out what, what the problem is and what their hangup is. And how, how can I, with what limited control I have, try to make their lives better? Or how can I go out and try to find other resources to bring to bear to make their lives better? Or how can I engage them in the problem solving around their situation to try to make their lives better? There are things I can do, even though I'm not a leader, just sort of putting on my, my thinking cap and my empathy hat for a minute and trying to work with them to affect a solution that makes sense for all of us. And you can do that without necessarily having organizational authority. If you, you might be a city manager or, or a police chief or you know, whatever you happen to be in your community and you're in a position of authority, but you may be dealing with an organization that's, that's um, static or the culture's thick um, and difficult to move and, 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 the, and the appetite for change is not great. There are things you can do to soften that culture. Uh, Lewin had a great, has a great theory about change where you've got to sort of, um, you know, got to unfreeze the culture first, get it warm and lubed up and moving, then, then start to think about changes and then try to refreeze the, the new culture back into a new way of doing things. There's been some criticisms of that model, but I think it's a very effective metaphor for thinking about how to move your organization if it's stuck. You got to recognize that the stuckness is about values and about culture, and you got to start there and working with people to soften that up and get people to realize, to become aware of that, you know, boy, I think you're right. We probably do need to start to make some shifts. We're doing some things that are not healthy here. Start, start with it, that awareness first and unfreeze the culture that in the organization that you're dealing with if you think it's thick or stuck. Thank you, Lund. Uh, we got two more questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, as a public sector employer, how can you encourage your management team to consider telecommuting options when the management team believes there will be less productivity or you will affect customer service internally and externally? Well, I remember now a couple decades ago, and I think I was at Washington State University at the time, and we were beginning to dip our toe in the water of online learning. This is quite some time ago. So this was at the front end of the curve of online learning. And I had senior faculty tenured and it's hard to get them to move sometimes to do something if they don't want to. And they, they yield a lot of power, especially in terms of what the curriculum is gonna look like appropriately, they should. Um, and we had some senior faculty that didn't wanna make the move to online learning. We wanted to take an undergraduate program in information systems and do an online version of it because we had all this demand out in Seattle that we just couldn't satisfy from Pullman. And there were people who couldn't come to Pullman four and a half hour drive. But I knew that Stanford University had developed an online master's degree in uh, electrical engineering. Imagine that, and this is more than, God, this is even more than 20 years ago. I mean, it was right before anybody really had started doing anything. And they were even, they were, they were mailing circuit boards to people so that you could do work at home on a, with a circuit board. And, and we thought, God, if they can do it, 
with an electrical engineering degree, then we can do it. And that was at the graduate level. Then we can certainly do it with undergrads. And, and we're really about as technical as it gets is where we're teaching coding and learning HTML uh, and some of the programming languages at the time. You could certainly, we could figure out how to teach coding in an online environment. But just talking about it intellectually wasn't enough to convince those faculty members. So we literally took a group and we went to Palo Alto and we visited and talked with, the, we had our recalcitrant faculty talking to those faculty at Stanford about how they did it. We weren't a threat to Stanford with our undergrad degree. And so they were very open to us. And that was really influential in convincing people that, all right, if they can do it at Stanford, we can do it at Washington State University, go Cougs. Uh, and so then we, that helped to get buy-in. I had another situation where I had some of the faculty willing to take an MBA program online and Stephen Gilliland and Cindy will remember this. I had some faculty wanting to do it and then we had some faculty not wanting to do it. And what we had to do there was just convince the, the, our employees who didn't want to do it. In your case, leadership team members who don't want to do it, just convince them, please just sit to the side, just don't get in the way let us do this, just, just let us do this, please. And the and benefits will reap back to you, I promise you. And then we took the willing, sort of the coalition of the willing in that case to develop an online MBA and built it up successfully. And, and now it's thriving while, while the on-ground MBA enrollments at that school have shrunk and the online enrollments have grown. And that accrued benefits and revenue that then benefited those other faculty. So, you know, you might not be able to take those leadership team members head on because they might really have dug their heels in, but maybe then it's, and there are things you can do, like take them to another city where things are working and let them see how remote work is working, physically go look at it. And if that doesn't work, then pick out the coalition of the willing. You've probably got leadership team members and employees who are willing, and then you just need to convince the others to just let you do an experiment and just try it. Uh, and prove to them, do a proof of concept that it'll work. And maybe that's the way to go after them. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and this question we have is that, do you have any recommendations for how to handle the transition back into regular mode? I think a lot of us developed a higher tolerance for change in the pandemic, and we're given more latitude to handle emergency situations. Our organization is not going to be receptive to maintaining any telecommuting options, for example. How do we keep the spirit of resilience and feeling of autonomy, even if our organization's parameters may not necessarily support that? Well, yeah, that's a tough one. It, so, I, I mean, I think what I'm hearing in that is that as, as you take your organization back in, in, in you know, mid to late summer, or perhaps fall by the time we're all sort of fully back, whatever, whatever that's gonna be for us, that you might still have that the organization's just not gonna be okay with remote work or some of the other elements uh, going forward that you might think personally that might be, might be helpful uh, you know, as you get into the fall. Um, I, you know, <laughs> this is a case where I think you wanna be over communicating with your, both your employees and your, whether it's customers, clients, community members, wh whoever the stakeholders are that you're serving uh, outside the organization, you wanna be over communicating with them as you head into the fall. Let's sort of keep the fall as sort of the bogey out there of the time. Um, there are a number of ways that you can do that. So in our case, we would do, like we're gonna do, uh, we'll meet with our faculty senate next week uh, to, to continue the conversation. So that's employees. Um, about what our COVID plans are for the fall. We're gonna do an all faculty briefing the week after that, that'll grab all of those employees. We've decided to add in a staff. Uh, so faculty and staff, we're gonna add in a staff, uh, all staff briefing for that following week as well, just before the end of the semester. So before everybody kind of goes off and it's hard to get for summer, we wanna make sure that we get in front of every single employee to talk about preparations for the fall and solicit their feedback again about you know, where you're sitting now, what do you think you feel comfortable with in doing in the fall? And then that will continue over the summer. And, we're, we're like, and with our incoming cohort of students, we're doing a lot of communicating about their expectations, new students for fall, and what they're expecting from us in services we're gonna provide and what their preferences are for fall. 
and over communicating. And you may be, you might have, may have restrictions about what you can do about remote and what you can do about continuing things digitally or not. Um, but, I, but I guarantee you that regardless of whatever your restrictions are, as long as you're talking to people inside and out about their needs, desires, expectations, their comfort level, and doing the best you can to build in as much as you can, um, even if you can't build all of it in, I guarantee you're going to be in better shape than if you're not talking to people because they're, they're going to at least feel that they were heard and they were listened to. And that will help their spirit. That'll help with, I think, their patience with you and their resilience going forward. And I think the last thing on resilience is just make sure that you continue to give people enough time to rest over the summer. Uh, I would encourage your employees to take, take their time off. If, it, if you're in a situation where it's accruing and then it goes away if they don't use it, make them use it. Make them take, take time off and get a, get a break and build, build in extra time if you can. Give them an extra day. Uh, you can't believe what, how much wind that'll put in the sails of your team members if you make a little gesture like that as you head into summer and fall. Wow, Len, thank you. I know that was one question after another. So oh, thank you. That's for... perfect, yeah. Great, great. Um, well, with that, we'd like to wrap up today's time. And again, Len, thank you for your presentation. And next mm -hmm. week, we'll have uh, uh, Michelle Bly. Uh, Professor Michelle Bly is the Dean of uh, the School of uh, Social Science, Policy and Evaluation. And Michelle will be talking about how to find your own leadership path. And I just, I'm so looking forward to that. And with that, uh, please contact me if you have any questions. Uh, you probably received my email already. So just email me and we look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday at 10. And a quick plug thank you. for Michelle is that Michelle's the Dean of our School of Social Sciences and knows more uh, than I do about leadership by far. So you're gonna enjoy Michelle, she's a terrific presenter. And then Regina, this is the first of eight, eight sessions eight that's three. right yes michelle is next yes and we have a, a, a very strong lineup of speakers for you Wonderful. so stay in tuned okay great um we'll see you next week excellent yep. bye bye thanks everyone enjoy summer right around the corner <laughs>